The Mid-Triassic is a time of strange and unusual life forms, as the world is still recovering from the mass extinction at the end of the Permian. However, life has been able to produce large herbivores and even super predators, including some larger than any living terrestrial predators. Warming itself on the early morning sun is the largest predator on the planet, Erythrosuchus. This five meter long carnivore is over a ton in weight, and on top of his muscular shoulders sits his disproportionately large head. With jaws lined with thick serrated teeth, he is more than well equipped to bite almost any animal he comes across in half. Though as an archosaur he is not completely cold-blooded, but his sheer size means he still needs to bask in the sun in order to become fully active. In this arid landscape, all life has to eventually find water to survive, and this is where the Erythrosuchus lays in wait. Out of sight amongst the ferns, he is able to observe everything that comes to this stretch of river. One of the larger residents has turned up. One of the herbivorous diacnodonts. Two meters long, squat and round, it is one of the Erythrosuchus's main sources of prey, though he still has to catch it. The herbivore has unknowingly walked right past the small hill the predator has been resting on, and though he is in a good position to strike from, he still is warming up. But the Diictodont might finish drinking before he can launch an attack. While drinking, the beaked herbivore picks up the scent of something close by and begins to walk away from the Erythrosuchus's hiding spot, so the predator takes his chance. He gets to his feet and moves to go down the slight incline, but some of the ground gives under his weight, and he ends up sliding down the hill with rocks and sediment collapsing all around him. The mini landslide he creates alerts the Diagnodont, who proceeds to move as fast as he can. However, due to his body, he is not particularly fast, and moves in more of a hastened waddle. The Erythrosuchus pulls his lower body out of the partially collapsed hill, and begins to pursue. Though his head may seem to be a hindrance, when running, he is in fact much faster than his target, and quickly begins to close the gap. His every step is greater than his prey, who desperately tries to keep away from those enormous jaws, but bit by bit the hunter was closing in. However, it seemed that his slip-up at the start of the chase may have saved the Diakdodon's life. The Erythrosuchus hadn't built up enough energy, and began to slow. Despite his hunger, he, like most reptiles, tired easily, and soon, he was only able to keep pace with his prey. The Diictodont was also tired, but if he could just stay a few steps ahead, maybe he could make it. Suddenly, there was a splashing sound. The herbivore turned his head around and saw the predator had seemingly fallen into the river, causing the water to splash in all directions. The Diictodont halted and watched as the water settled, and saw the huge head of the hunter break the surface. In the very tip of its jaws, held the tail of a large amphibian, Paraclytosaurus. At 2.5 meters long, it was an ambush predator, snapping up fish from the bottom of rivers and creeks. Unfortunately, its size was also its downfall, as when the Eryptosuchus saw the amphibian beneath the water, the huge carnivore decided to try and catch it instead of the Diictodont. The small herbivore was now scuttling back into the ferns. The large amphibian struggled to get out of the Erythrosuchian's jaws, but to no avail. Once the predator hauled himself back onto dry land, he flicked his head back, making the amphibian airborne for a brief second, before biting him in half. The male Erythrosuchus gathered up and swallowed the severed pieces of his meal, and made his way back to his sunbaking spot. Thanks to his split-second decision to dive into the river, he was now cold again, and had to dry off but at least his hunger was sated, for now. Hello everyone and welcome back. Today we will be breaking down another odd-looking Triassic creature, Erythrosuchus. Erythrosuchus was first discovered in 1905 in the Karoo Desert in South Africa. It was the largest member of the Erythrosuchian family, a group of reptiles that lived in the Triassic and contained seven species. It grew up to 5 meters long, stood around 1.2 meters tall, and its head alone was 1 meter in length. Weight has been difficult to calculate, with low estimates of 500 kilos and high estimates of 2 tons. 
More recent studies have put it at between 1 and 1.2 tons. Erythrosuchus was an archosauriform, so closely related to the ancestors of archosaurs like crocodiles, dinosaurs, and birds. It's basically as close as you can get to them without being in their family. It lived in the middle of the Triassic, a time when Earth was recovering from the Permian-Triassic mass extinction. As the Earth was recovering, different species evolved to replace those that died out, including that of top predator, which Erythrosuchus and others of its family came to fill. It was not only the largest predator of its time, it was also the largest terrestrial predator the Earth had seen up to that point, beating out Permian heavyweights like Gorgonopsids and Anteosaurus. They evolved from smaller, more basal predators like Archosaurus itself, many of which had the signature hooked upper jaws. Erythrosuchians would retain this, though not in the same over-the-top degree. Speaking of over-the-top, let's discuss that enormous head. Erythrosuchus had a seemingly over-proportionally large head resting on its otherwise normal body, at a meter long and filled with large serrated teeth that could grow up to 20 centimeters, it was clearly an apex predator, built to deliver bone-crushing bites similar to later carnivorous dinosaurs. Though the back of the skull is quite broad, its snout does narrow down, helping to reduce weight. With that in mind, the neck muscles that supported the skull were huge and robust, allowing it to properly hold it up even if it did mean that it was hard to tell what was neck and what was shoulder. On a final note on the skull, Erythrosuchus did have a notch located between the maxilla and the premaxilla, much like crocodilians, which raised the question, could it have hunted aquatic prey, or even been semi-aquatic itself? Though its body doesn't appear adapted for life in the water, when you're the planet's apex predator, everything may be on the menu, it's just a matter of catching it. Its four legs hauled around its large head, and though it was once thought to stand upright, and then sprawled out, it is now believed to have walked in a semi-erect stance, not holding its legs directly beneath itself like a dinosaur, and not to its side like a crocodile, but somewhere in between. One clue to this is the development of the fourth trochanter in the femur. This is a muscle attachment site near the head of the femur that is crucial in an animal being able to hold itself erect, and in later species, like the dinosaurs, becoming bipedal. Erythrosuchus's fourth trophactor was separated from the femoral head, but not in the same degree as later species. In many ways, Erythrosuchus was a transitional species, steadily evolving with other archosauriforms. Even its ankles show some signs of developing towards digitigrade, walking on its toes, instead of plantigrade, walking on its palms. Despite Erythrosuchus and its family's early success, they would only reign for about 12 to 15 million years being replaced by more efficient predators, like the Pseudosuchians, who would in turn be replaced by the dinosaurs. Still, they were able to rise up out of the world's worst mass extinction, and along with other archosauriforms, carve out their respective niches in a world that was full of synapsids, the species that would be the ancestors of mammals. Rising to the top to become the planet's top predator, and what a strange looking predator it was like a kid took the head off a T-Rex toy and put it on the body of a lizard toy. But what do you think of Erythrosuchus? Please put in as many head jokes in the comments section as possible. What lesser known extinct creature would you like me to do a breakdown on next? And until then, please like, share, subscribe, and thank you for watching.